First of all, I want to just thank you all for the privilege to be here, not only hopefully to serve you for a few minutes here, but also to attend. I have some friends that have gone to TED in the past, and I've been thinking about coming, and I was on the edge, and then I got invited, and I said, I want to come. So I've attended about two-thirds of this, and I've gotten an enormous amount, not only from the speakers, but from so many people that I've met. I don't think in all the places I've spoken or been around, and, and I've been privileged to be in a lot of great places, as I'm sure you have, I've ever seen such a concentration of both talent, brains, but also passion and a common value. There's a community here about contribution, and it's really beautiful. So I thank you. I'll be back as a participant myself on an ongoing basis, and I thank everybody for their participation as well very much. Thank you. I have to tell you, I'm both challenged and excited. My excitement is uh, I get a chance to give something back. My challenge is the shortest seminar I usually do is 50 hours. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not exaggerating, I do weekends, and what I do, I do more than that, obviously, coach people, but I'm into immersion, because how'd you learn language? You didn't learn it by just learning principles. You got in it, and you did it so often that it became real, and my stuff isn't pre-programmed. You know, something happens in the room, I ask a question, and I play off what's going there, and 17 minutes, that's not gonna happen. I know we're gonna put the principles across, and I'm beyond respectful to the format, and I've gotten great value from it, although uh, Lisa Randall, I felt very tough for how to explain, you know, Einstein's theories in 18 minutes. <laughs> to make sure that you're served, though, because I really came here to serve, is um, I put some tapes in your box, but I want you to know that if you want to use net time, I call it no extra time to learn some of these things and use them at a deeper level. If you call my office and you're from TED, you're on the list, you can get any product I have, there's no charge for it. And if you ever want to come to a seminar, I'd love to have you as my guest as well for something in more depth. So my gift to you, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, the race begins. I've probably put a lot in here because I really want to try and serve you, and I hope it doesn't just sound like philosophy since we can't do the interaction at the same level, although I hope you'll participate with me a bit. The bottom line of why I'm here is that I'm really in a position, I'm not here to motivate you, obviously. You don't need that. And a lot of times, that's what people think I do, and it's the furthest thing from it. Um, what happens, though, is people say to me, well, I don't need any motivation. And I say, well, that's interesting. That's not what I do. I'm the why guy. I don't know why you do what you do. What is your motive for action? What is it that drives you in your life today, not 10 years ago, or are you running the same pattern? Because I believe that the invisible force of internal drive activated is the most important thing in the world. I'm here because I believe emotion is the force of life. All of us here have great minds. You know, most of us here have great minds, right? I don't know if I'm in the category, but we all know how to think. And with our minds, we can rationalize anything, we can make anything happen. We can, uh, I agree with what was described a few days ago about this idea that people work in their self-interest, but we all know that you don't work in your self-interest all the time. Because when emotion comes into it, the wiring changes in the way it functions. And so it's wonderful for us to think intellectually about how the life of the world is, and especially those who are very smart. We can play this game in our head, but I really want to know what's driving you. And what I'd like to maybe invite you to do by the end of this talk is explore where you are today for two reasons. One, so that you can contribute more. And two, so that hopefully we can not just understand other people more, but maybe appreciate them more and create the kinds of connections that can stop some of the challenges that we face in our society today. They're only going to get magnified by the very technology that's connecting us because it's making us intersect. And that intersection doesn't always create the view of everybody now understands everybody and everybody appreciates everybody. So I've had an obsession basically for 30 years. And that obsession has been what makes the difference in the quality of people's lives? What makes a difference in their performance? Because that's what I got hired to do. I got to produce the result now. That's what I've done for 30 years. I get the phone call when the athlete is burning down on national television and they were ahead by five strokes and now they can't get back on the course and I gotta do something right now to get the result or nothing matters. I get the phone call when the child is gonna commit suicide and I gotta do something right now. And in 29 years, I'm very grateful to tell you I've never lost one in 29 years. It doesn't mean I won't someday, but I haven't done it. And the reason is an understanding of these human needs that I wanna talk to you about. Um, so when I get those calls about performance, that's one thing, like how do you make a change? But also, I'm looking to see what is it that's shaping that person's ability to contribute, to do something beyond themselves. So maybe the real question is, you know, I look at life and say there's two master lessons. One is there's the science of achievement, which almost everyone in this room has mastered to an amazing extent. That's how do you take the invisible and make it visible, right? How do you take what you dream about and make it happen? Whether it be your business, your contribution to society, money, whatever it is for you, your body, your family. But the other lesson of life that is rarely mastered is the art of fulfillment. Because science is easy, right? We know the rules, you write the code, you follow those, and you get the result. Once you know the game, you just, you know, you up the ante, don't you? But when it comes to fulfillment, that's an art. And the reason is it's about appreciation and it's about contribution. 
You can only feel so much by yourself. So I've had an interesting laboratory to try to answer the question of the real question, which is what's the difference in somebody's life if you look at somebody like those people that you've given everything to, like the, all the resources they say they need. You gave them not a $100 computer, you gave them the best computer. You gave them love, you gave them joy, you were there to comfort them. And those people very often, and you know some of them, I'm sure, end up the rest of their life with all this love, education, money, and background, spending their life going in and out of rehab. And then you meet people that have been through ultimate pain, psychologically, sexually, spiritually, emotionally abused, and not always, but often they become some of the people that contribute the most to society. So the question we've got to ask ourselves really is, what is it? What is it that shapes us? And we live in a therapy culture. Most of us don't do that, but the culture is a therapy culture. And what I mean by that is the mindset that we are our past. And everybody in this room, you wouldn't be in this room if you bought that theory, but the, most of society thinks biography is destiny. The past equals the future. And of course it does if you live there. But what people in this room know, and what we have to remind ourselves though, because you can know something intellectually. You can know what to do and then not use it, not apply it. So really what we gotta remind ourselves is decision is the ultimate power. That's what it really is. Now, when you ask people, you know, have you failed to achieve something? How many have ever failed to achieve something significant in your life? Say, I. <laughs> Thanks for the interaction on a high level there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you ask people, why didn't you achieve something? Somebody who's working for you, you know, or a partner, or even yourself, and you failed to achieve a goal, what's the reason people say they failed to achieve? What do they tell you? Tell me, come on out loud. Don't have the, didn't know enough, didn't have the knowledge, didn't have the money, didn't have the time, didn't have the technology, you know? I didn't have the right manager. <laughs> didn't have the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, and, what do all those, including the Supreme Court, have in common? <laughs> they are a claim to you missing resources. And they may be accurate. You may not have the money. You may not have the Supreme Court. But that is not the defining factor. <laughs> and you correct me if I'm wrong. The defining factor is never resources, it's resourcefulness. And what I mean specifically, rather than just some phrase, is if you have emotion, human emotion, something that I experienced from you day before yesterday at a level that is as profound as I've ever experienced, and if you'd communicated with that emotion, I believe you would have won. But how easy for me to tell him what he should do. <laughs> Idiot, Robbins. <laughs> but I know when we watched a debate, when we watched the debate at that time, there were emotions that blocked people's ability to get this man's intellect and capacity and the way they came across to some people in that day. Because I know people that wanted to vote in your direction and didn't, and I was upset. But there was emotion that was there. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say I. <laughs> so emotion is it, and if we get the right emotion, we can get ourselves to do anything. We can get through it. If you're creative enough, playful enough, fun enough, can you get through to anybody, yes or no? Yeah. If you don't have the money, but you're creative or determined enough, you find the way. So this is the ultimate resource, but this is not the story that people tell us, right? The story people tell us is a bunch of different stories. They tell us we don't have the resources, but ultimately, if you take a look here, flip it up if you would, they say, what are all the reasons they have in common? We've said that, next one, please. He's broken my pattern. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciated the energy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what determines your resources? We've said decision shape destiny, which is my focus here. If decision shape destiny, what determines it is three decisions. What are you gonna focus on? Right now, you have to decide what you're gonna focus on. In this second, consciously or unconsciously, the minute you decide to focus on something, you gotta give it a meaning. And whatever that meaning is produces emotion. Is this the end or the beginning? Is God punishing me or rewarding me or is this the roll of the dice? An emotion then creates what we're gonna do, or the action. So think about your own life, the decisions that have shaped your destiny. And that sounds really heavy, but in the last five or 10 years, 15 years, haven't there been some decisions you've made that if you made a different decision, your life would be completely different?